is up you guys welcome back to my channel it is october i swear i wait for this month every single year you guys know that i love halloween and also it is the month of halloween for those of you that are not aware what that is for the past few years i have done a week of videos seven full days the week leading up to halloween and i was unsure i mentioned this in my last video if i would be able to do it this year and I think I'm going to go ahead and promise you guys at least two videos. Raylan's surgery went amazing and she has recovered in basically an instant. So I no longer have to worry about that. And thank you to those of you who left sweet comments in last week's video. I'm almost positive, fingers crossed, that I will be moving into my workspace this weekend. So if all of this goes as planned... I should at least be able to get a couple of videos out to you guys during Halloween. week. Maybe not the full seven. That's my end goal and it's what I'm going to try for. Um, but you're definitely going to have a little bit of extra content. Now, speaking of Halloween and the long await for Halloween, week, I have something to hold you guys over until then. I was watching something the other day and it is an awesome documentary called Superstitious Minds on Magellan TV, who is also today's sponsor. Magellan TV is a membership streaming service founded by filmmakers, producers, and curators to bring a unique variety of documentaries, series, and exclusives straight to you. There are many different genres to choose from, including space, ancient, and modern history, the obvious favorite, which is true crime. The second that we had one day that felt like fall, I wanted to get cozy and watch something kind of spooky and interesting, and I stumbled across Magellan TV's Ultimate Halloween playlist and found a superstitious minds and it's an awesome documentary that goes into all of the modern day superstitions that we tend to have it talks about days of the week that might bother us or people that carry around a lucky object just in case and it even brings in the psychological element to explain why we as humans tend to be superstitious sometimes and it's just a really interesting documentary they have all sorts of other options right now to keep your spooky appetite satisfied such as war on witches for those of you who are into that it talks about the different witches in france and germany as well as a documentary series called The Other Side, which is a show that follows paranormal investigators. Magellan adds new programs weekly, so there's always something new and interesting to watch, and you can stream anytime, anywhere from most different streaming services, such as Amazon Fire, Google Play. You can stream and cast from your phone to your television, and you can even watch some of these programs in 4K at absolutely no additional cost. Plus, my favorite perk, there are no interruptions. If you wanna try out Magellan TV and check out their ultimate Halloween playlist while you're waiting for for Hollow Week, all you have to do is go to try.magellantv.com forward slash Danielle Hallen and you will get a one month free membership trial. Thank you again to Magellan TV and now let's get into today's case. Today we will be speaking about the disappearance and murder of 13 year old Robert B. Jr. who was also known as Bonsai by those that lived in the town of Pekin, Illinois where he was from. Um, it took me a few extra days with this case, which is why this video is going up a little bit later. I wanted to make sure I did it justice um, because there is a lot that's going on. Bonsai went missing on November 18th, 2016, and his case is so complicated and challenging. So we are going to be here for quite a while going through the information. Um, and when I first looked into this case a few years ago, probably right when I first started my channel, I had a lot of different suggestions from people asking me to cover Bonsai's case. And when I would go to look up information, um, I could barely find anything other than a handful of Facebook groups that seemed to just be tossing around theories and uh, just very basic and short articles online. When I recently went to look up Bonsai's case, I stumbled across a documentary series by Ashes to Ash. And when I listened to the first few episodes, I wasn't sure what to expect because I already knew there seemed to be so little information online, but my jaw absolutely hit the floor. The information that Ash was able to uncover through being in Pekin and questioning people around the town showcased exactly how convoluted this case is. But at the same time, it showed how beneficial an external resource can be to an investigation and how sometimes just taking that extra time and care to dive deep and ask the hard questions and find the people that may be hard to find can make such a huge difference in a case. Bonsai's story is a story that has had an entire town questioning so many different things. Rumors have been running rampant for years since he went missing. There's a lot of confusing information. There's a lack of physical evidence. There are circumstances that may or may not be related. Uh, there is numerous versions of the events even online and people are involved 
uh, during the most recent theory that are heavily involved in drugs as well. So it makes their accounts questionable, but they have what seems to be the most possible theory at the time. And there's also a completely silent police department. But most of all, there is a 13 year old boy that I believe as well as many people believe was failed on so many different levels, just so blatantly failed. There's also right now even more people that are pushing for the truth and pushing for justice for Bonsai and I wanted to make sure I was able to help in that in any way possible and then direct you guys to other resources that are helping even further than I can. Ashes to Ash is who is covering Bonsai's story. It is ongoing. The most recent podcast I think released maybe the day that I'm releasing this and it's just it's just keeping on rolling the more that Ash finds information and I wanted to encourage you guys to go to the Ashes to Ash website and subscribe. You can do a $5 tier or a $20 tier and there's a lot of different perks that come with each tier. You can get the podcast or the episodes early um, but the largest thing that's important to me is that your monthly donation goes to Ash's efforts to solve this case. There's information that's still unraveling. This is happening, you know, live time. We're getting to see what Ash is finding. I highly suggest you guys go and watch that. So now on to the actual case. Bonsai had a very complicated history. His mother's name was Lisa and his father's name was Robert B. Sr. And Robert Sr. was much, much older than Lisa was. He actually had a daughter that was older than Lisa. So Bonsai's half-sister was older than his mom and his niece was the same age as him, I believe. So very interesting family dynamics. Unfortunately, that meant that his father was not in his life a whole lot because his father ended up in a senior living home. Um, he was at a retirement home. I believe he had health issues that kind of caused this more than anything, but it just created a little bit of a difficulty. He didn't have a father figure there. He didn't have someone really keeping him straight and Lisa definitely didn't do it. So, and I will get more into that in a little bit. But as I said, Lisa ended up being the main caretaker of Bonsai because his father ended up in a retirement home and Lisa was not exactly the most capable mother. She had another son, Bonsai's half-brother, who had been taken from her home at some point. I don't know the history or details about that. All I know is that it was deemed she was not a fit parent, so he was taken away, and I believe he ended up with Lisa's brother, so Bonsai's uncle. So it's not all too surprising that Bonsai more than likely should have been taken from her care as well. Bonsai was a really sweet boy, and it seems, in my opinion, that he is the definition of a product of your own environment. His mom loved him to death, and he, he was a good boy, but around his mother, at least, he was impossible to parent, and that's what Lisa stated herself. He struggled a lot with anger issues. He had ADHD, he was diagnosed with epilepsy, which is irrelevant to his behavioral issues, um, but I just wanted to throw that in there, uh, along with his ADHD. And she said that he was very violent and he basically did whatever he wanted. He would talk back, talk horribly to her. I've seen evidence of this and screenshots from um, interactions on social media. But again, I think this likely was because of Lisa's way of life. I think that the way that Lisa live, lived strongly influenced Bonsai's behavior. Lisa struggled with drugs. I am not sure which. I have heard all kinds of drugs that she's used throughout the course of figuring out what exactly happened in the story and listening to the different interviews on Ashes to Ash. Lisa also was apparently involved in sex work according to many rumors around the town. I think Lisa herself has denied this, but it's just a large amount of people that have claimed she was. And there is no issue in my opinion at all with sex work, but there is an issue with the way that these people were saying Lisa was a part of sex work. She would sometimes kick Bonsai fully out of the house. He would have nowhere to go. She would kick him out no matter what time it was for men to come over. There were even reports that sometimes Bonsai would be in a vehicle where the sex work was taking place. Um, and again, Lisa has denied all that. So take that as you will, but they're pretty 
detailed <laughs> rumors about all of that occurring. So he grew up surrounded by drugs and potentially dangerous men and in situations where he was exposed to things that he should not have been exposed to at all at that age. Other individuals were in and out of the home frequently and it seemed like Lisa would just kind of bring people in that she was close to or that needed a place to stay and they would take over Bonsai's room, leaving him to sleep on a blue plasticky cot in the living room. Which honestly, while that sounds terrible and it was terrible, it didn't really matter because the house itself was unlivable no matter what room you were in. Most of the time there was no air conditioning, most of the time there was no water, there was no heat. The beds, chairs, counters, any surface that existed in that home was covered in piles and piles and piles of trash, dirty clothes, feces, they had dogs, they had cats, there was urine everywhere, cat litter was everywhere. I'm going to be posting pictures later on of a little bit of this. This led Bonsai to being bullied in school because they didn't have a washer or dryer and uh, I guess Lisa would not take any of the clothing into town to clean at a laundromat so I don't even know when either of their clothes were ever cleaned or if they were ever cleaned. And so they would smell bad and Bonsai would be picked on for this. But in a typical pattern in Bonsai's life, one instance when he was bullied horribly in school for his clothes smelling bad because no one understood what was happening at home, he fought back. He fought back against someone bullying him. But do you know who ended up in trouble? Bonsai did. Bonsai was suspended because of it, even though he himself was the victim. And that right there to me is just like the epitome of what Bonsai's life was like. Friends that he would invite over were immediately disturbed by the state of the home. There was nowhere clean to sit. There was nothing ever to eat. Even if there was something to eat, you couldn't find any clean dishes. I don't even know if there was soap to clean any dishes. So this led Bonsai to staying places away from his home because it was just not a good situation. The main place that he loved to be was his sister's house and his sister's name was Stephanie. And I think she was 40 something at the time that he went missing. His sister, as I stated, had a daughter. This was technically Bonsai's niece, but they were right around the same age group. So they got along well and they grew up as if they were basically siblings. Bonsai would often call Stephanie upset over his mom saying he needed to be picked up. He'd be upset about his living circumstances. He would say he didn't have food and he was hungry. He would say that he was dirty or there was no water. And Stephanie, without hesitation, would always come and pick him up, set him up his own room in the home, get him fed, get him bathed, and he was okay. At Stephanie's, he wasn't the little boy that Lisa always described him as. I don't know if maybe there's just things that haven't been disclosed, but from what I've seen, he just, he was. When he was in his different environment where he was being taken care of, he was not this angry little boy that was rebellious and defiant. Stephanie put him into a private school where he stayed for, I think it was about a year and a half, and he did really well here. He didn't skip school at this school, but staying with Stephanie never seemed to last as long as it should have. Lisa loved her son, and honestly, I don't really doubt that. I've seen her speak about him. She did care about him. I just think she was in a very dark place of her life. She was involved in drugs. She was involved in sex work that was putting her into compromising situations, and I just think it got the best of her. Stephanie strongly believed that Lisa just really loved the assistance that she got from having a minor and not making a lot of money. And this ended up causing a lot of tension between the two from what I'm seeing. Lisa would ask for Bonsai back after he was with Stephanie for a while. And from what I'm understanding, Stephanie would always try to keep Bonsai because she knew he was better off with her and she would tell Lisa this. Um, she even offered, you know, to stay quiet about Bonsai being with her so that she would continue to get her benefits. She was paying her water bill at one point um, and other different bills, hoping to be able to keep Bonsai. But in the end, Lisa always got Bonsai back and this is just always what happened, even when DCFS was involved. There was one time where I know that DCFS did 100% take 
bonsai from Lisa's home. I don't know if there was any legal action taken against Lisa, but I do know that bonsai was put in Stephanie's care and Lisa was able to simply take parenting classes and she was able to get bonsai back. But even after all of this happened, there were still many days where bonsai spent a lot of time over at Stephanie's house. He would call to be picked up or sometimes he would even go and stay at the retirement home where his father was to get away from his house and his mother for a little bit. And he would also go to friends' houses on the weekends that he was really close to. So you get the gist at this point, he was a mama's boy. Lots of people said that he loved his mother, but it was just a very tension-filled relationship. He was probably not happy with her lifestyle. Um, he probably rebelled a lot because of it. This led him down questionable paths and she didn't want that because she was his mother, even though she was going down questionable paths. So it seemed just chaotic. So now we'll talk about Bonsai's disappearance. Most articles that I read simply stated something along these lines, that Bonsai was last seen on Thursday, November 17th, 2016, after running away from truancy officers that had come to his house to escort him back to school. But that is, <laughs> I almost want to like <laughs> cry and laugh all at the same time hearing that because that is absolutely not all that happened. And the fact that it took so long for so much information to come out that is crucial to this case is just mind blowing to me. We'll start on November 9th, a little while before Bonsai disappeared. On November 9th, things were pretty bad for Bonsai and Lisa. DCFS had come to their home one of many occasions and saw the state that it was in. And I'm very interested to know what brought DCFS out this time. I know that there are dozens of calls that were put into CPS about Bonsai and his living circumstances and the mother and the care his mother was or was not giving to him. Um, but they came, saw the state of the home, and they actually condemned it. That's how bad it was. And they told Lisa the only way that she would be able to keep Bonsai is if she cleaned the house up. So... Lisa somehow convinced the DCFS workers to let her keep Bonsai and that they were going to go stay at a neighbor's house for a while in safe, healthy, livable conditions while Lisa cleaned up their home on Sap Street. And then they would come out and do an inspection. And then hopefully at that point, she would be able to keep Bonsai with no other issues. I also want to note something that's highly disturbing. And one of the many things that's highly disturbing in this case, that day when DCFS came out and condemned a home, as like totally unlivable conditions. And to they allowed Lisa to leave with Bonsai to go stay at another home until Lisa cleaned it up. But they also found two dogs out back in kennels. And they said these dogs were in unlivable conditions just as Bonsai was, but they took the dogs. They took the dogs from the home, removed them permanently from Lisa's care. So they took the dogs to a safe place faster than they ever took Bonsai to one. Just let that sink in for a minute. Lisa and Bonsai went to a neighbor's home nearby. They did not know these neighbors very well, but these neighbors were kind and let them in. And uh, they and Lisa over the next three or four days cleaned the home. DCFS came back, inspected the home, allowed Lisa and Bonsai back into it. Now I'm going to show you real quick what DCFS considered as a livable environment for Bonsai. Now, as you can see, this is after she cleaned up and this is what Lisa considered to be spick and span and what DCFS considered an okay situation for Bonsai to be living in. Now, to top all of this off, the fact that, you know, you have a mother that's addicted to drugs, you have sex work happening in front of a child, potentially, you have an unlivable environment. Lisa also had a very dangerous ex-boyfriend at the time. Seven weeks or so prior to Bonsai's disappearance, a few weeks before this incident with DCFS, Lisa got a protective order against a man that she had been dating. She said that one day she came home and saw her ex-boyfriend crawling out of Bonsai's window and take off. The house was not secure. So not only were, you know, so not only was this dangerous ex-boyfriend breaking into the home, and I'll describe more of that in a minute, but clearly he was able to break into the home. How you ask? Well, because 
The home was never locked. According to Lisa, Bonsai lost the house key. The only way you could lock the door to the home was if you were inside of the home. But after this incident, she decided to take matters of safety into her own hand. She nailed all of the windows shut so you can no longer open them. And she also bolted the back door to the floor so you couldn't get in or out of the back door as well. So basically the front door was the only option, but it's still only locked from the inside. Now, after this ex-boyfriend had gotten into the home and she had secured it, she called police and she decided to ask for this protective order and complain that he was inside of the home. But after this, her ex-boyfriend apparently didn't stop. He started to show up at her window when she would be sleeping in the room with Bonsai or just hanging out in the room with Bonsai. And this ex-boyfriend would scream and threaten to kill Bonsai and hurt Lisa. Um, and there was even a time where she claimed that strange men in a vehicle showed up as she was pulling into her home at two in the morning. Um, and they drove right in between her and the house and she didn't know who they were. And she eventually was able to scare them off, but it was just every single aspect about Bonsai's life was just living in danger. Back to when they went back into the home. The neighbors remembered that as soon as Lisa and Bonsai were back into their home on Sap Street, Lisa immediately went out to party, which meant that Bonsai was left alone at home in this house that is unlivable, that is dangerous because an ex-boyfriend is stalking it. So the neighbors went to go and check on Bonsai and they remembered opening up the door and Bonsai was inside with a bottle of liquor. So the neighbors went to go and find his mom to you know, resolve the situation because a 13 year old doesn't need to be drinking liquor, but his mom was at this party strung out and of absolutely no help. Within one week, Bonsai went missing. Now we already know the version that I mainly stumbled across online that Bonsai went missing after running from truancy officers on Thursday, November the 17th of 2016. But I'm going to start this through the information that I've been able to gather through Ashes to Ash and using other resources that have started reporting since then. On Wednesday, the 16th of November, according to Lisa and a woman named Teresa Butts, Bonsai stayed at the Butts' home. They had a son, his name was Christopher. He was much older than Bonsai, but he was autistic and their mental level was about at the same place, so they got along great. Christopher loved playing Xbox, I don't think Bonsai had an Xbox, so I'm sure that was very exciting as a 13 year old boy to go over to a friend's house and play. Um, they just got along a lot. So this is a place that Bonsai spent a lot of time. For quite some time, Teresa Butts remembers that Bonsai would come to their home almost every single weekend. He would hang out. From what I'm seeing, he wasn't ever any trouble over there. And she also knew that Bonsai wasn't in great living conditions because Christopher had gone over there at one point to hang out and immediately called his mom and came back to his house because of the state of the bee home. So she felt like Bonsai being over there was better than nothing. And she also knew that Bonsai's mom would go out on the weekends to party, leaving him by himself for the most part. This particular week was the first time that Bonsai had been there during the school week. The night of the 16th was normal. Um, the following morning, Thursday, November 17th, the day that is widely reported as Bonsai's missing date, Bonsai was woken up by Teresa, so was Chris. Christopher, they got ready for school and they went to the bus stop. So this is kind of a big deal because again, like I was saying, it seems like the same terrible circumstances just happen over and over to Bonsai. So it was a huge deal that he was going to school this day because he would skip school quite frequently. And unfortunately he got to the bus stop and he had a drink on him and the bus driver would not allow him on the bus with a drink. So I mean, it's just like how many times how many, how many times, you know, you have to encourage children like this to go, you have to be positive and push them the right way. And it was just like one knock after another. So because of this bonds, I was basically just like, F it, I'm not going then. And he left. Bonsai ended up going back to his home on Sap Street, but fairly quickly, truancy officers showed up at the home. And if you're not aware of what a truancy officer is, there's someone that's hired by a public school or just like a public school system to service many schools and they monitor continuous absences of a child, of a student. And past a certain point, they go and do essentially like what's the equivalent of like a welfare check on the child. They go to the home, they will escort these children to school. They will figure out why they're not going to school. And I think eventually they will issue a ticket to the parent and then past, I believe the third time when the officer has to visit, 
you actually have to go to court. The parent has to go to court and explain why their child's not going to school because that is your responsibility as a parent to get your child there. So this particular morning, a truancy officer, a police officer, and I've even seen the principal all came to Bonsai's home to issue Lisa a ticket because Bonsai had not been coming to school. And from my understanding, Bonsai got into an argument with the officers because they were trying to escort him back to school as expected. And he didn't want any part of this, so he eventually fled on foot. Now this part is where most documentation stops on a lot of different resources. But the truth is Bonsai was seen well after this into the following day. So after he took off on foot, no one's exactly sure where he went, but he did end up with one of his other teenage friends. Bonsai typically hung out with a crowd much older than him. I'm sure because he was basically fending for himself, he was at a different maturity level, so to speak. And um, so I can completely see this. And this friend ended up calling Lisa and was like, hey, just wanted to let you know, Bonsai is not at school. He's actually with me. Now, Lisa at this point said, this isn't going to work. I'm going to get in trouble. The truancy officers were there. So she told this teenager to take Bonsai back to the butt's home and for Bonsai to stay there until she was able to get back from Peoria, which is a town that is just next door. That is exactly where Bonsai ended up, back at the butt's home on Thursday, the 17th of November. November. And Teresa was not happy with this. She didn't want to have her family look bad because Bonds had been staying with them and he didn't end up going to school that day. So she told him that if he wanted to be able to stay at their house, he would need to go to school to show up there so it didn't cause any more problems. Bonsai ended up at some point that day back at his mom's house when she did arrive back home. Um, and by around 6 p.m. that night, he had convinced her to take him back to the butt's house. He promised he would go to school the next day. So that's where he went. She dropped him off there. And then she said she was going to Peoria to party at a woman named Patty's house. I know for a fact he ended up here because Teresa has said that he ended up here and so has Lisa. And they both had stories corroborating each other and basically stating the same thing that at some point that night, night, Bonsai ended up calling his mom. He said that he wanted her to bring him cigarettes. They got into an argument over it. And then later on, he called her back. Teresa actually encouraged him to do this, um, to apologize that he had been disrespectful and he should have treated her better. So we know for a fact he did end up there that night. The following morning was the exact same thing all over again, however. Teresa woke the boys up. They were both supposed to go and get on their buses, but Bonsai never made it on the bus and never made it to school that day. Sometime around 10, a little probably a little bit before 10 a.m. that morning, truancy officers and police officers showed up at Teresa's house yet again and they found a locked up home with no sign of Lisa or Bonsai. So they called Lisa to let her know they were there to give her a ticket that they needed to speak to her about the fact that Bonsai had not made it to school yet again. I think she also was going to have to go to court at this point. Um, and she was shocked to hear that Bonsai had yet again not gone to school. She told officers that Bonsai had stayed at the Butts house that night before, so that's where they headed. They went to the Butts house, they checked everything out, they spoke to Teresa. She said the exact same thing that happened the day before was happening again, that she sent him off to the bus, and she didn't know what happened after that, but everything seemed fine that morning, and he was nowhere to be found on the Butts property. At this point, they called Lisa, told her she really needed to come back, um, and they would speak to her. Teresa apparently didn't come back home until I think it was around 3 or 3.30 and truancy officers asked her to come home at around 10 and when she arrived back they explained to her the situation and she decided to report Bonsai as missing. Now she thought it was interesting because she believed Bonsai had actually been home that day that when the police officers came that morning Bonsai or at least in my opinion someone was inside of the house because they said when they arrived the door was locked and when Lisa arrived home the door was unlocked. Now, if you remember, the door only locked from the inside. So that means that when authorities were knocking on the door, someone had to have been inside to have that door locked. Lisa also stated there was peanut butter and a spoon sitting out on a side table and she believed Bonsai had this out as a snack. There also was a bag of clothes that Lisa claimed were the clothes that Bonsai took to the butt's house. Um, and her mail also was scattered all around the floor. And again, when she got home, the door was unlocked. So she believed Bonsai for some reason and at some point that day had gone back to 
her house, which is exactly what he had done the day before, and then left and something must have happened after that. Now, I don't know if authorities sat outside of the home waiting for her all day. I highly, highly doubt authorities did wait from about 10, 10, 30 to three o'clock in the afternoon. So there would have been a time period where Bonsai or whoever was in the home could have left unnoticed. But a lot of people were already starting to think there was something strange going on because there had been many times where Bonsai had ran away from home, had skipped school, where truancy officers had shown up, DCFS had shown up, and Lisa never reported Bonsai as missing. So a lot of people believed it was strange that all of a sudden there was a sense of urgency as if she knew something when there had never been before. Detective Rainey, who was the detective that was assigned to the case, that has always worked the case, that I'm pretty sure is still working the case, also noticed that Lisa's reaction to her son's disappearance was unusual. Stephanie, Bonsai's sister, and Stephanie's daughter also thought the same. They were so upset that they did not hear Bonsai had disappeared until they saw it on the news. And Lisa didn't call them until afterwards. And when Lisa did finally call them, they thought it was so strange that she, you know, was acting very weird. She didn't seem interested in going to locate him. Um, she seemed upset, but she was putting no effort into searches. So they ended up rushing over to pick up Lisa and go to all the places that Bonsai might be. There was even a potential sighting of Bonsai that day in Peoria, and they basically had to force Lisa to go, which they thought was strange. She didn't want to go and look at she didn't want to go and look at security footage to identify someone thought to be her son, and they just thought that was really weird. Now, one thing that I do want to clear up real quick that a few media sources state is that Lisa initially changed her story. One of the first articles that I read at all said that Lisa agreed with the fact that Bonsai ran from truancy officers on the 17th and was never seen again. And then that she told some stories to searchers that spoke about him sleeping over at the Butts house and all of that. But I don't know what she told the searchers. Maybe she was switching up her stories to people, but I do know for a fact that she was the one who led the police officers to the Butts house on Friday the 18th. So she did tell authorities that he was there. So this could easily be the fact that she was involved in drugs and maybe was forgetting things or was seeing what was said in the media. I'm unsure. Um, but I just wanted to kind of make that clear. But unfortunately, this is kind of something that is very common in this case, finger pointing and, you know, a lot of confusion over circumstances and different things that happened. At that moment, Bonsai was just considered a runaway because of his history. There was no Amber Alert because there wasn't any evidence that he had been abducted. Um, he did have a history of running away and, um, you know, getting in trouble with the law enforcement and his mother. But friends and family and strangers all decided they couldn't wait for authorities to search for Bonsai. And something that authorities probably should have, should have taken into consideration was the fact that Bonsai had epilepsy, that he was being treated and was on medication for seizures. And he left without any money, without any medication, without anything. And it was also below freezing during this time frame. So his life was in danger and he should have been considered an endangered missing child from the start. But unfortunately, that's just not what happened. Friends, family, and the community that were concerned all checked places that Bonsai would normally go at the park, down by the rivers, at friends' houses, and no one seemed to have seen or heard from Bonsai since he left for his bus stop and never showed up. I do know that one classmate did come forward and I don't know if this has been fully confirmed, uh, but this classmate said that she got to school at around 7, 7.30 and was about to head in and she remembered seeing Bonsai outside of the school and he was looking at it almost like he was contemplating whether he was going to go in or not, but she never ended up seeing him in any classes. And then when her mom picked her up, her mom was like, we're going to go search for Bonsai. He's missing. And she was like, what? I just saw him this morning. Um, but that's kind of one of the only times that someone that knew Bonsai claims to have seen him after that early morning. None of his friends also claimed to have seen him, even the older teenage friends, which was strange as well because that's usually where he would end up. He never ended up at Stephanie's house. He never called her. Um, he never ended up with his father. So there was clearly something wrong this time. While some people were saying that Lisa wasn't searching and still there's a lot of speculation and, you know, people looking at Lisa, she claims that at this time she was in fact going door to door, talking to people, trying to figure out where he was. She also says that she was 
was trying to set up an aerial search, but unfortunately, police decided to shut down a lot of these searches right off the bat. They were worried that these searches were going to jeopardize the investigation um, because there was a lot going on and there were these Facebook groups that were created and groups of people were getting together. And Lisa claimed that once authorities kind of shut this down and said, stop doing this, stop searching, that she stopped, but majority of people didn't. They completely defied this and just kept on searching for Bonsai because they felt the authorities aren't doing it. He clearly could be in danger. He doesn't have medication. It's freezing cold. He has nowhere to go. So they kept searching anyways. Now, unfortunately, while that is good, it's been a very big double-edged sword in this particular case. The Facebook groups and a lot of these searchers were the only ones fighting for Bonsai, and I want to make that very clear. But it also was one of the main sources of rumors and drama and false information. Now, you can't keep all the bad apples out of situations like that. There's always going to be the few rogue people in the groups that kind of take everybody down, and I do believe everyone had good intentions intentions, but it unfortunately got very wild. There were some people that would just relentlessly contact authorities, were questioning individuals that, you know, deserved their privacy, and there were a lot of false leads that were going on. There was one person in particular that ended up being charged with obstruction of justice because they called in a false tip to authorities stating that they saw Bonsai, like physically saw Bonsai go into this house and that authorities needed to go and search it. And that wasn't true at all. It turned out this person just thought that house was a potentially sketchy place and good place for authorities to check. And that's the only reason they made this extravagant lie up of actually seeing Bonsai in order to get authorities to go and search this home. There were arguments left and right. I mean, I've heard about the drama in the Facebook groups from the first time that I even looked into this case. But between the chaos and the bad apples that were in the groups, they held vigils. And these people were taking the time away from their family to search in the heat, in the middle of the woods, difficult places to navigate, using their own money to bring Bonsai home. It took about a month and a half for authorities to finally start realizing that this was a little bit more serious than they initially believed, and they finally labeled Bonsai as an endangered missing teen. They searched homes of Bonsai's family that hadn't actually even seen Lisa or Bonsai in, I think, a couple of years. They went to make sure he wasn't at Stephanie's house and his uncle's house and all these different places, making sure no one was harboring him. They questioned individuals that were close to Bonsai. They chased down leads, but with so much noise in the case, unfortunately, it was very, very difficult to keep things straight. A month after Bonsai went missing, Lisa ended up overdosing. She said that this was an attempt at her life because she could not handle the fact that Bonsai was missing. She spent a few days in the hospital and then ended up spending a month in a rehab facility, I think 60 miles away from Pekin. And then from there, she went into a um, home to clean up. Um, and this was also about 60 miles away from Pekin. And a lot of people kind of just saw it as her just, you know, up and leaving suspiciously. But she did overdose and struggle with all these things. So she was trying to help get herself better from what I understand. I do know that there was one more attempt at her own life in this time frame as well. Um, I'm not exactly sure when, but that was kind of her constant struggle. While everyone was out looking for Bonsai and trying to figure it out, she was, you know, battling drugs still and suicide and suicide and all these different, she was battling drugs still and all these different issues. So that's kind of where she was. Now on January the 3rd, Lisa was supposed to appear in court. There was a truancy hearing related to Bonsai, which in my opinion, kind of seems strange because he was reported as a missing person at this point, but I get why they would still do it. Um, and Lisa didn't show up. Obviously, at this point, I think we know it's because she was in a rehabilitation facility. Um, but Stephanie said that this was just another way that Lisa was pretty much getting out of her responsibilities. And she publicly said to the court that Lisa was going to have to deal with her until Bonsai was found because Stephanie knew the level of neglect in the home, that Lisa had not taken proper care of Bonsai, did not give him the best chance he had at survival. So there was just a lot of tension and anger, which I can completely understand. On March 8th of 2017, without any answers as to what happened to his son, Robert Sr. ended up passing away. And many said that it was his son's disappearance that really destroyed him and pushed him to this. In July, searches were still ongoing and a tip on July 23rd ended up leading the Facebook group and another organization to something very interesting. 
So the Facebook group that was mainly in charge of a lot of the searches had gotten in contact with an organization called Trucks for Kids. And from my understanding, they had been searching, I think since like early in the year, January or February. Um, and Trucks for Kids had a pretty good success rate at finding children, runaways, missing children. And they had conducted a ton of different searches for Bonsai so far. Apparently, this tip that came in was from a friend of Lisa's. This friend of Lisa's said that Lisa told them that Bonsai had been put into a tote that had originally been used for Christmas decorations, and then he was thrown over the 474 bridge to be disposed of. And I don't think this was Lisa admitting she had done this. Um, Lisa would often kind of listen to the different rumors that were around or she would say what she thought like her own theories of what may have happened to him um, but this was very specific so they decided to go out to this location on the 23rd while they were there boats were there searching the river there had just been a flood there were searchers kind of going along the banks and those searchers found a jawbone a part of a spine, there was also duct tape, a red and gray sweatshirt, which matched exactly what Bonsai had been reported to have been wearing. When there were a few other items, I think there was like a tarp. And what are the chances that they stumbled across these things with a shirt that matched the description of what he was wearing, this jawbone, you know, a tarp, all these things exactly where Lisa said that they would be found. So obviously they called authorities and it ended up being just another issue in the case. There was a huge gray line on whose jurisdiction it was and neither of the jurisdictions were peeking. One was Bartonville police and the other was Peoria police. And when they showed up, there are all these people searching in this area. This could have been a crime scene. They didn't shut it down. Instead, both jurisdictions fought for an hour on who was going to take the case because apparently it was too expensive to take on a potential murder case and neither of them wanted to do it or put the work into it. So I guess after arguing it out for over an hour while everyone's destroying a potential crime scene, Peoria ended up leaving and Bartonville police simply took pictures of what was found, threw it all into a trash bag and left. Didn't question anyone. I think they took down the names and phone numbers and addresses and stuff of the searchers, but no one knows what they did with this. It was never, you know, treated as if it were a crime scene. There was never a unit that was brought out to look into it or anything. I think that one of the police officers even told some of the searchers that the teeth and the jawbone that they found were fish teeth and they're like very obviously human teeth. So I think they were really just trying to push away from the idea that this could in any way, shape or form be related to any type of murder or Bonsai's disappearance. But then the next day, something huge happened and everyone thinks it is quite the coincidence. July 24th, 2017, a man was mowing his lawn at the intersection of Woodford Drive and Route 29, which is a heavily traveled area. It kind of connects the main part of Pekin to South Pekin. Uh, and this location, if I'm not mistaken, was only two miles south of where Bonsai lived. While this man was mowing his lawn, he has a big six foot chain link fence around his home, but he ended up finding a human skull. And knowing what he did, that this little boy was missing and just, he had just been there three weeks prior and had not seen this skull, he had just mowed, he called authorities. Authorities arrived and they took the skull and they also searched on the other side of the fence to see if there were any other remains. And they ended up finding most of the remains of whoever this was. It was just bones, there was no flesh or anything, and they were just kind of scattered around a large area. Authorities and the man who owned the property both kind of wondered if this set of remains had been recently dumped there for multiple different reasons. The bones were kind of scattered in an odd way, the skull ended up on the other side of a six foot fence, um, chain link fence, this man had just mowed there three weeks prior and hadn't seen it. Now, granted, if the skull had just kind of been put over the fence, authorities believe an animal could have done this potentially. Um, you know, if the skull had just gone over the fence, I can see how maybe he wouldn't have noticed it three weeks prior if, you know, the remains were just outside of the fence. It was very heavily wooded. It was the middle of summer, so I'm sure it would have been difficult to see any of the other remains. Um, but also the thing that bothers me past that is, let's say they were on the other side of the fence. This man 
frequently mowed his lawn. He'd probably been mowing it for months at this point because of the spring and the summer and the grass was growing. And at that point, rate of decay would have been pretty serious. So how did he not smell anything? Even if it hadn't been summertime, you know, really amplifying the smell of a decaying body, you still would have smelled it in the dead of winter when it was cold. And the fact that he hadn't smelled this or noticed anything strange in that area was just kind of weird. So they really believed you know, despite the fact that animals may have moved the body a little bit, that this was remains that had been dumped there. And as if that's not enough to kind of convince you of that, trucks for kids and all of the searchers were flabbergasted because this area had already been searched multiple, multiple times. Trucks for kids had just been out there about a month prior. They had gone through that exact same area. They knew exactly where they had been. They documented where they had been and they had even taken a drone over that area and not a single person found any remains. And from what I'm seeing, it's not like the remains were necessarily hidden or buried in any sort of way. So every single person was like, there's no way that these remains have been there because we looked there. Now the area itself was difficult to get to. Um, you could get onto this man's property and there was a gate and his chain link fence that kind of went out behind it. And behind his chain link fence was a pretty heavy wooded area and it backed up to a railroad track and also a river called the Lost River. Oh, so if you had followed the train tracks for quite some time, I believe there were trails that went off of it that you know, you could have gone off trail at that point and gotten to this area, but it just wasn't making a lot of sense because it was difficult to navigate. And plus it seemed like a stretch that someone would walk through a stranger's backyard in order to dump remains. And on top of that, if you were going to do that, or if you were just disposing of a body in general and you're gonna go to the extent of, you know, traveling along train tracks and going on trails and veering off trails and getting through the brush, why would you then dump the remains in front of somebody's gate, like right by the door to get out? That just seems very lazy or unthought out. I don't think you would go through all of that to then make it so obvious. So it was just kind of weird. Now, because it was only bones, there was a huge challenge ahead of authorities. First of all, identifying bones is hard in itself. Um, you know, you have to get DNA. Sometimes you can use dental records, which is what happened in this case, as well as DNA. But at that point, if it's just bones, there is no physical evidence usually. At that point, between you know decomposition and weathering, any physical evidence that had been on the body left behind by the killer, you can pretty much say it's not there anymore. And on top of that, it's really difficult at that point to figure out what the cause of death is. The remains were immediately sent to Morton, Illinois to a forensic lab and they were able to tell on the following day, the 25th, that the remains were consistent with Bonsai and his age and his stature, um, but they wanted to do further DNA testing and they wanted to also use his dental records to confirm that it was him. And after a couple of weeks, I believe in early September, they were able to definitively say that these remains belonged to Bonsai. The community was devastated and so confused because how did multiple searches of this area not find this little boy's body? And, uh, and if he was dumped by someone, who dumped him there? And then it became even more of a worry because these Facebook groups were consistently talking about the searches they were doing, where they were, what they found there, what they didn't find there. Had someone been watching that, anyone could have been on there seeing where they were searching and maybe either A, wanted the remains to be found and dumped them there, hoping they'd eventually end up back there, or B, figured, oh, they've already searched this a few times, there's no way they're coming back, so I'll go ahead and dump them there now. It was just a very weird situation. And then to top it off, you know, what, what is up with all of those things that were found by the river the day prior? Everyone just said there was something weird going on here. Too many crazy coincidences were happening and everyone just wanted to understand what was going on and what happened to Bonsai. And to make things even more confusing on top of all of that, the property on the other side of the fence where a majority of Bonsai's remains were found, the person who owned the land had a nephew that was connected to both Bonsai and Lisa. So out of all of Pekin, out of all of the places his remains could have been found, it was on the property of someone that he was around quite frequently. This man's name was 
Keith. So Keith was very close to a lot of different people in Pekin, including a lot of the younger population. And according to um, a girl named Jess that lived with Lisa and Bonsai up until nine days before his disappearance. So right around the time it was condemned, Keith was close to Lisa as well. And Keith lived, I think at his parents' house and it was only a couple of blocks away from where Bonsai lived. I think only two blocks away, like two streets over. Keith was also really close friends with Jess, the girl that was living in the B home. And Keith and Jess apparently would take Bonsai to his family's property where Bonsai was later found to mow the grass there. So he had been there a handful of times. So because of the fact that there was a connection there, authorities showed up to Keith's home the day that Bonsai was found. They were taking boxes out of his house. I believe he was in handcuffs, eventually taken into the police station. I know searchers went to his house actually multiple times. And what's interesting is that they actually found rope there that apparently matched the rope that was found near Bonsai's body. Now, according to Lisa, they were never able to definitively say that it was the same rope. She said they couldn't get any sort of DNA or anything off of the rope found by Bonsai. Um, and from what I'm also understanding, something happened to the rope or something along those lines. Now, I don't know if they ever physically were able to take the rope found at his house or if I'll, I'll just explain it. This is very confusing. So I really hope you're, you're hanging in there with me. So basically Keith had a bunch of tents set up outside of his house and a lot of people would come there and stay, including these young children, because he would buy them alcohol, marijuana, whatever they wanted. And he would hang out with these younger kids, which was already questionable in itself, but apparently this is kind of a common thing that happened around Pekin and adults most of the time were involved and okay with it as well. Now these tents were kind of like, there were tents, there were also tarps and they were held up by ropes. And I don't know if he just admitted that he had this rope at his house, but that he threw it away, which is a story that I've seen, or if they physically found and took the rope like the way Lisa has explained it. Um, but basically I have seen that Keith had a rope at his house that was similar to the rope found by Bonsai. And he said that he apparently threw it away. That's what he told authorities. But then later on, a couple came forward saying that there was a garage sale at Keith's house and he was all of a sudden getting rid of all of his tents. And one of the tents was supposed to come with a rope, the same kind of rope that authorities are talking about and found by Bonsai. But they said that when they got the tent, this rope was missing. And a lot of people believed that this was Keith's attempt at kind of disposing of evidence and keeping with the story of, oh, I got rid of that rope, I don't have it anymore. So initially, this was the main person that they believed was responsible for whatever happened to Bonsai. They have, it's the only person they've publicly stated um, is connected to Bonsai and where his remains were found. But from what I've seen, not much else has happened. I know that he was shortly after this um, charged in a burglary and he got out on bond and then he skipped states on bond. So he was eventually brought back and then held on a $300,000 bail. And according to a lot of local people, well, first of all, we all know that's a very high bail amount for someone brought in on burglary, but he did also skip out on bond. So maybe it could have been that high, but a lot of people believe it was that high in order for authorities to keep him in jail so he couldn't get out and question him on Bonsai's disappearance. But now, unfortunately though, on top of that, there are a ton of other possibilities of what happened to Bonsai, all kind of being spread as rumors or, you know, he said, she said, hearsay around Pekin. Searchers believed there was a huge chance that Bonsai was alive and well for actually a couple of days past when he was initially last seen. And there are a lot of reasons why the searchers believe this, including eyewitness accounts. First of all, searchers found an abandoned, I think it was a horse trailer in the middle of the woods nearby. I'm not exactly sure what the location was, but it was in close enough vicinity to everything going on that they believe Bonsai could have been staying here. Now, inside of that horse trailer, there were mattresses, there was a sleeping bag, um, and apparently there was some outline or stain on the mattress and searchers believed that Bonsai could have been staying there or potentially killed there. They did report this to authorities, but no one is really sure if authorities ever went to this location because when Ash went to search this area and look with the searchers, everything remained untouched. 
Then as I was saying, there were also eyewitnesses that said that they saw Bonsai days after he went missing. So there were a handful of sightings of Bonsai all within five days that he first went missing. Two people, or I think possibly three, I can't remember the exact amount, saw him on the VF, saw him on VFW, two or potentially three, I couldn't nail that down 100%, saw Bonsai walking on the VFW road, which is essentially like a highway. And it is right beside where his body was found. And it was, according to these witnesses, very strange to see anyone walking on this road. I have looked at it and kind of walked it through Google Maps. I don't understand why you would walk down this road. There is a state prison or a federal prison on the corner. And it's basically a highway. There is a stretch of nothing. And after a good long walk, a very good long walk, you would eventually get to a shopping center with like a Walmart. Now maybe... His goal was to get to a shopping center to, you know, steal some things to survive. I'm unsure, but there would have been closer places. So I don't understand why he would have been walking down this highway. The people that saw him, you know, remembered seeing him and then getting home and being like, I swear that was that missing boy. And one man in particular said that he was so startled that he saw someone walking down this road because he took this road every day for work and he had never seen that before that he, you know, was looking for a disabled vehicle to see if he needed to help someone and he didn't see that. And then when he got home, that's when he realized he was pretty positive that that was Bonsai that he saw. And then on the 23rd of November, days after Bonsai was allegedly last seen, a bow hunter saw him and this was not even half a mile away from where Bonsai was eventually found, his remains. This bow hunter obviously was hunting and he was hunting right along the train tracks right there and he heard a noise behind him. And so he turned around to see what it was because he's obviously listening out for deer. And instead of seeing a deer, he saw Bonsai. He's pretty positive it was Bonsai. This young kid was walking along the railroad tracks and he remembers thinking this is super strange. First of all, why is this kid out here? I'm sure it was probably early in the morning. Um, you know, why is this kid on train tracks as well? That's dangerous. And when he got home, he was so sure that he had seen Bonsai now that he had the chance to kind of sit with it and think about it, that he called authorities and reported this. But for one reason or another, authorities didn't go out for a month and a half to this location, which to me makes no sense because I'm not sure what they assumed they would find. Um, it's really disheartening to think that if authorities had gone to that location right when the man got home and reported it, that there's a chance they could have found Bonsai alive and well nearby. Uh, but unfortunately, we will never know if that's what would have happened because they didn't go and check. So it seems like Bonsai was hanging out in that general area. And again, this is kind of where he was found along the VFW highway and down those railroad tracks. Now, while none of those sightings were confirmed, the people were very sure that that's exactly who they saw. And considering he was found so close nearby, I don't think that they're making this up or that it was absolutely somebody different. So it makes you wonder what exactly happened to him along those train tracks. I know that there is quite a homeless population in Pekin. Um, I know that they more than likely would use the railroad tracks to kind of travel to and from different areas. There's also a creek nearby. Did he maybe stumble across the wrong person? Uh, but to top it off, he was seen in that area for days. So it makes me wonder where was he staying in that vicinity? If he was seen there, he likely was staying somewhere around there. Um, you know, in the woods, it, there weren't that many options in that area. And if he traveled any further into Pekin, he would be traveling in toward his home. And I feel like someone would have recognized him at that point. So I find it even stranger because if he was walking down the railroad tracks towards where he was eventually found, there's nothing that direction, but a 55 minute walk through fields until you get to South Pekin and there's nothing in between. There's another theory that ended up coming to light in regards to what happened exactly to Bonsai that the documentary series ended up unearthing. And this is what's currently going on on ashes to ash and I think could potentially be the answer to what happened to Bonsai. It all just fits a little bit too perfectly but I'm even scared to say that because Keith it sounds like a possibility. I mean everything just sounds like a possibility. Him stumbling into the wrong person along this train track sounds like a possibility. There's just absolutely no telling. So I guess a few years ago prior to when this documentary series was released Someone came forward with a theory. I'm not exactly sure who. And this person was called crazy. This whole entire theory and everyone involved in it involves a lot around... This whole entire theory revolves around a bunch of people that use meth. And... 
because of this, despite the fact that it fits well into the timeline and it kind of makes sense and there have been multiple different accounts of this and people coming forward, um, it just is difficult because you're really having to trust the words of someone that could have been strung out, ha like how coherent were they? Um, you know, you have to ask yourself, were they imagining things? Did they all create a story while they were high and it just kind of stuck? So, but I feel like there is enough backing this to where there's a huge potential what these people are saying is true. So when this documentary came out, a woman named Kendra ended up coming forward after hearing about it, saying that she heard from her group of friends what really happened to Bonsai. She said that she was good friends with a woman named Teresa. And one day, Teresa and Kendra were getting high together, and she said that she knew exactly what happened to Bonsai. Bonsai had been killed at a house at 1400 Heelman, which is only like a two minute walk from Bonsai's house. The house itself was owned by a man named Jerry Birch and Jerry at the time that he first began to rent the house, he was not on drugs, he would just work night shifts, but he eventually started to take in different individuals that needed somewhere to go. There were a few women that were going through hardships and he didn't want them homeless or in trouble. So he kept them up in his house, um, made sure they were safe, fed, warm, comfortable. And unfortunately, it started to draw other people into the house. And when you're drawing in people that are struggling, um, because Pekin has such a drug problem, a lot of the times the people struggling are struggling with drugs. Jerry would leave his house at around 10 at night and he said every single night, like clockwork, uh, it would basically turn into a party the second he left. There would be unknown amounts of people at his home getting high. And then by the time he would come back, they would all be gone. And these people would sometimes steal from him and, you know, destroy his house. But he wanted to protect these young women that were in his house. So he just kind of lived with the fact that they were all doing this. And eventually he ended up in the drug lifestyle with them. Now, Teresa said that she was at Jerry's house and a guy named Randy was there. There was a guy named Josh that was there and I think maybe a handful of other people, but I don't think any of them have, you know, for 100% fact been proven to be there. Um, and she said that Bonsai for one reason or another ended up at the house. This is what Teresa told Kendra and that he ended up using meth for the very first time. And Josh was a guy that was there and he said that Bonsai was being very annoying. He had just used meth, he was behaving erratically afterwards and Josh was getting tired of it. So he ended up shoving Bonsai. Well, Bonsai was standing near a very steep staircase when he shoved him. And so Bonsai fell down the staircase and apparently broke his neck and died. And there are a few accounts saying that Josh then went down there and started to beat Bonsai and strangle him, like grab him by the neck, and Bonsai died. Now, they decided from there to dispose of his body. They put him into a freezer that was in the basement of this home. That's where the stairs led to. And that eventually, I guess the body began to smell in the freezer. So they disposed of his remains afterwards. And I have not seen any further details into that. There's speculation, obviously, and then there's obviously how his body was found. And Randy corroborated the story. Randy, Kendra knew very well. Randy was someone that was there. And um, apparently he said the exact same thing when Kendra asked him. So right off the bat, this kind of seems plausible because this was an area that he frequented. He would have walked by this house probably numerous times. He was known for hanging out with older individuals. There are a lot of people that said that uh, Bonsai also used drugs. I mean, he's watching his mom do it, so I'm sure he's assuming it's okay for him to do it. I've also even potentially seen that Lisa would allow him to smoke marijuana in front of her. I've seen that they, you know, inhaled duster together at one point. So it's not that far of a fetch that if someone had offered him meth that he wouldn't have taken it. And then when you tie this into the fact that it's speculated that Bonsai was killed elsewhere and then dumped there, that would make sense with this theory. Plus, if you look at the timeline, it also makes sense because they would have put him in the freezer in November. He would have remained cold in the freezer and it being winter, but they said that they had to move him because he started to smell. And they believe his remains were put in that area shortly before they were found. So I'm thinking heat of the summer comes, decomposition speeds up, he's not staying as cold as he once was, and there's a smell happening. So in my opinion, I think it's very, very possible. Now, unfortunately, this theory in itself has presented a lot of issues. 
First of all, the guy named Josh, his name is Josh McCreary. And I guess everyone had been calling him Josh McLeary. I don't know. It's very difficult to understand. This is why I'm really encouraging you guys to listen to this documentary series on him. But apparently a lot of people have been speaking about someone named Josh McLeary when really they meant Josh McReary. And this theory and this man's name had been you know, going around for a very long time. And again, no one took it seriously, or it was this case of wrong identity, wrong name being used, or everyone just thought this person telling the story was on meth, so they were clearly crazy. But now we have all these different people that are corroborating the story. To top it off, a lot of people feel very unsafe, like their life is in danger, especially Kendra, because she was very brave. She came out, she spoke on camera in this documentary and called out people that were her best friends. But she said she wanted to do better and that what happened was not right and she couldn't sit with it any longer. Now, Randy is apparently incarcerated, so he can't give any more details. I know they're trying to get in contact with him, um, but they haven't spoken to him yet. But we're able to speak to Jerry and Teresa and this caused quite a few interesting things. Kendra, when she came forward to Ash, pointed the finger at Teresa, saying Teresa initially said that she knew what happened to Bonsai, and then Randy ended up giving her all the full details, and Teresa basically corroborated it. But when Ash spoke to Teresa, Teresa basically pointed the finger at Kendra and said that Kendra was there, and Kendra told her what happened to Bonsai, but Kendra has always said she was never there. So now Kendra's saying Teresa's there and she knew, and now Teresa's saying she wasn't there, Kendra was there, and that's who knew. So they're pointing the finger at each other at this point. And Ash spoke to Teresa. Teresa had this whole spiel about how, you know, she searched for Bonsai and she was a mother and wanted, you know, no one else to lose their child and all of this. Um, she said that Josh, the guy who allegedly killed Bonsai, Josh McCreary, had taken her van at one point. She said she had a van, she had let Josh and a few other people borrow it, and she was like, you know, now that I think about it, I'm wondering if, you know, they maybe took my van to move the body. And she acted like this was the first time she'd ever heard about it. But then when Ash started speaking to other people, things became a little bit questionable when it came to Teresa. Teresa apparently had the tendency of forcing minors to use drugs. And this is according to one of her victims. This victim said that Teresa forced drugs um, on him and it just became a disaster. And once he became an adult, he realized I don't have to keep taking drugs with you because you say I have to. And so he parted ways from Teresa. He also said that Teresa had a history of violence and she was just a crazy, crazy bad person. So this would line up with the fact that Bonsai was given meth and everyone's saying that Josh was the one that gave Bonsai meth, but this makes you question if potentially Teresa was the one to do it since she had a history of offering drugs to young individuals. A family friend also said that right after Bonsai's disappearance, Teresa dropped her young daughter off at their house saying that she just needed to go to the hospital or somewhere with a friend of hers, but she never came back to get her child. And I think to this day has not taken her child back and Maron went rogue basically. She went into hiding and no one could contact her. Teresa kind of came up and ended up speaking obviously to Ash when this whole documentary happened and everyone was really shocked about it. Kendra said that after she was told this information about Bonsai um, that Teresa just kind of vanished. So even those that were kind of close to her hadn't seen her. It also contradicted something that Teresa said. So Teresa said that Josh had borrowed her van and that may have been the time that they disposed of Bonsai. But Jerry says that Teresa and Josh and a few other individuals came to his house using Teresa's van and they were acting suspicious. He said when he pulled up, they were like throwing blankets into the back of the van, which he thought was strange, but he just assumed, you know, they usually steal my stuff. So they're probably just stealing more. And now that he thinks back on it, he's wondering if that was a time where they disposed of Bonsai because he says the timeline kind of matches up. Jerry also said that after Bonds I went missing, Teresa randomly performed a seance inside of his house, that she lit a candle, that she started to claim that she was psychic. I don't know if she had ever claimed this before, but the way Jerry describes it, it seemed like she all of a sudden was kind of saying she was psychic. And she said that she was experiencing flashes and dreams that were telling her what happened to Bonsai and where he was. Saying that he was scattered around, his bones were scattered around. I mean, everything to a T with how he was found. And that's not the only person 
that was told this by Teresa. Someone entirely separate, that was a friend of hers, was in the car with her one day and she pointed outside of the house where he was found, the, the property where he was found. She pointed there and was like, that is where Bonsai is. I know where Bonsai is and I know how he was killed. And she, to this person said it. And there's even a Facebook post that was dug up from the day that Bonsai's remains were discovered where she, you know, made this huge post saying, everyone makes fun of me saying I'm not psychic, but I told you maybe next time you'll listen to me that he was in this area. So it's kind of this very difficult situation where, you know, yeah, of course, Teresa can be saying that she is psychic. She could have had these visions. And, you know, if you believe in that, that's fine. But at the same time, it's kind of a conflict of interest, so to speak, when you are also being pointed out as someone who was in the home when it happened. And when you've also told people the story that he was pushed down the stairs there, and then you all of a sudden go back and say, no, 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 I wasn't even there. So Ash right now is trying to get to the bottom of this theory because while things differ, and these are people that have been on meth and could, potentially have had their memory affected because of that. Um, while some things differ, the same exact details are being told by everyone. Um, that Bonsai ended up at the house, that he was given meth, that he annoyed Josh, and then he was thrown down the stairs. So it's kind of hard to say whether this is something that actually happened or maybe it started as a rumor or something that Teresa said and started telling people and then it was just kind of like a game of telephone and that's how we got to this theory today. Just all a mess because it's very difficult to understand who to believe and who not to believe because Bonsai's own mom apparently told two other people as well in an entirely separate theory and time you know, she befriended these two people while she was in the psych ward and she remained friends with them after the fact. And apparently after the fact, she told them that that Thursday night while she was in Peoria, her ex-boyfriend called, said that he had been roughhousing with Bonsai and accidentally killed him and that she needed to come and help him dispose of the body. You know, she directly told two individuals that who then reported it to police and said that they are almost positive that she was telling the truth. But she spoke to him that night. She knew he was at the Butts house and the Butts confirmed that they left the next morning and she knows this. So this is where you start to wonder, you know, there's a disconnect there and the use of drugs I think is making people say things and do things. And so it's so hard to navigate a case when that's where the information is coming from, when everything is surrounded in drugs and just confusion and lack of structure and it's just a disaster, a freaking disaster. It just really makes you wonder how many absurd versions and rumors of the story have gone around. And, you know, we've already heard many of them in my video. There are so many more, so many more in the documentary about this by from by Ashes to Ash. I mean, they speak about a pastor that could potentially be involved. I mean, there's so many other different theories. I just chose the ones that seemed the most plausible for this video, but Ash goes in and looks at every single rumor, every single thing and speaks to the people, discredits some, uh, but you know, it's just wild. And I can understand why everyone's so frustrated from the searchers to authorities, um, because it's it feels impossible to understand this case. It took me multiple times listening to this podcast and sitting down and going through everything to understand all the people involved. And I still feel like I don't fully understand and don't have everything straight. Um, but that's why I really, really wanted to push you guys to go and support Ash because I genuinely feel she has made leaps and bounds with Bonsai's case. And I know you guys are passionate about this case because I've received a ridiculous amount of requests for it. It's just upsetting and it's frustrating because if Bonsai had been taken by DCFS, like he should have been numerous times, if he was placed in the care of Stephanie, who he clearly enjoyed being with, who clearly took care of him, we wouldn't be here. And you know, obviously there's still someone that murdered him and that person's absolutely responsible for that. But you have to sit and think about all the different times where he was failed. You know, the people that were hard on him at school that didn't take the time to understand what was going on. No, of course they didn't know, but I feel like we all just don't even think twice about what could be happening in someone's life to cause them to be the way that they are. And I think it's very important. It's something that we've all lost touch of. We are so self-involved that we truly don't think about someone else and what they could be going through. And let me know what you guys think down below.
there is so much going on. I think it's too hard to ignore Keith because there's this mystery about this rope and then the fact that he ties back to this property. Um, you know, maybe if you have someone in your backyard in one of your tents or, you know, did he, did Bonsai go there to be safe for the day? Did maybe something happen? Um, there's a lot of speculation that Keith was potentially sexually involved with minors and maybe something happened, Bonsai fought back. And there's just too many different things about that particular theory that makes sense to ignore it. And then at the same time, I mean, what everyone is saying about this house on Heelman and Bonsai being pushed down the stairs, I mean, down to the fact that they said that Josh went down and strangled him. You know, did he use rope? Is that where, you know, the idea of strangulation comes in, even from the coroner? I mean, it even fits with that, down to the fact that he was dumped after the fact and was killed in a different location. There's just so many different possibilities here, and I'm very interested to see what you guys think. If you haven't already, go ahead and hit the subscribe button to become a part of the Hallen fam so that we can hopefully bring them home together or bring them justice together, and I will see you guys in my next video. Bye.